welcome to a special bonus episode of yes. the Weekly Stuff Podcast with Jonathan Lack and Sean Chapman. This is our first bonus episode for the month of August 2017. Yeah. Our plan is to do one of these a month, and or at least one of these a month, and the main topic for this first bonus series, maybe we'll do more series in the yeah. future, who knows, is classic Doctor Who. Classic Doctor Who. Look, if you listen to the main show, you know we love Doctor Who. Sean over here has seen every episode, both classic and modern. Yes. Many of them twice. Yes, and important distinction is I watched them in chronological order for the first time, which is an insane thing to do. Yes. I don't in any way recommend it. You should absolutely do it, but you shouldn't do it at all. But yeah. Yeah. It was, when you did it, it was a lot harder, too. Yes, there no yes. I mean, it was, it was, you know, it's not a secret that I pirated most of those episodes the first time I watched them because there was no godly way I'd be able to watch them otherwise. Yes. So anyway, uh, while I am a huge fan of modern Doctor Who, but also, um, kind of also through Sean's recommendations, have watched a good deal of classic Doctor yeah. Who and have experience with all the Doctors. But the goal of this series is that every month we're going to pick a classic Doctor Who story, we're going to watch it, you guys hopefully watch it. And we're going to talk about it. Yeah. And that's it. So, Sean, why don't you explain just a little bit about why we wanted to do this project and then introduce our first episode or story that we are going to be doing here and give us some context. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, it's something that we talk about Doctor Who all the time on our main show, The Weekly Stuff Podcast. So if you've you listened to that a lot, you know when there's a new season, uh, we do reviews of all the episodes as the season goes on and do like sort of bigger episodes around like, like we're going to have to do a big one for when Peter Capaldi and Stephen Moffat leave at Christmas and that kind of stuff. But we don't have as much opportunity to talk about classic Doctor Who as either of us would like, either for me of being able to like go back and reflect on this stuff or for Jonathan for you to be able to watch some of these classic Doctor Who stories and, and talk about them for the first time. Because there's a lot of them and they're somewhat time consuming yeah. and sometimes I need an excuse. <laughs> exactly. So we have done like bits and pieces over the years. We've we've sort of peppered them in where we could, but we was always having to find some weird excuse of like, oh, it's the Matt Smith is regenerating, so let's pick like two or three regeneration stories and talk about those and that kind of stuff. Where I think we talked about Spearhead from Space and like the twin dilemma for like two polar fucking opposite uh, Doctor Who stories in terms of quality. Yep. So it's like, we have talked about classic Doctor Who, but it's been a long time since we like talked about it in any sort of like ordered, directed fashion. And I think this is a good format to sort of sit down and really talk about it. And one of the things I want to be able to do with um, this sort of like series of podcasts, the sort of first series of podcasts we're doing on classic Doctor Who is take us through um, one story for each of the Doctors going through them all the way through, through classic Doctor Who and kind of get that broader over like upper like level sense of like what is classic doctor who what were the different eras what were the kinds of stories they told like what defines classic doctor who and how it maybe is it different from modern doctor who so i'm like assuming that people listening to this are at least going to have a familiarity with modern doctor who, like a basic familiarity with it and then like not that you've you know seen every episode but you know what the tardis is you know how the doctor works what a time lord is yeah just that, that kind of stuff. stuff but like i'm also going to assume that most of the people watching this have not don't have like an intense experience with classic Doctor Who and probably are watching most of these stories for the very first time. And so like that's part of like the sort of the one of the objectives is not just to sort of talk about these and have fun with them, but also kind of like give people context and, and kind of dig in deep from that perspective as well as like the I kind of think of it as it's like Doctor Who 101, you know, it's like you're the gonna, classroom. And you're gonna curate a list of episodes for us yes. so we can get a nice entry experience. And you're not picking ones that are like challenging for a new viewer you're picking no, yeah. really good ones yeah i'm picking some or, of my favorites and ones that like the kind of my two criteria were ones that i like and think are good and then the other criteria is ones that i feel like are emblematic or typical of sort of like some of the most interesting or best kinds of stories told from that era so that leads us into our first story where obviously we're starting with the first doctor william hartnell um this is from the first season it is the sixth ever serial of the show and it is the aztecs um, it is written by John Lucarati, which is he had wrote three stories for classic Doctor Who, all first Doctor stories and all historicals. The first one was Marco Polo, which was two serials before the Aztecs. And then the third one was The Massacre at St. Bartholomew's Eve, which unfortunately both Marco Polo and uh, The Massacre are completely lost. But they are both fantastic. Like they're kind of both, I think, the best sort of like episodes to watch in the kind of like recovered format that exists where you take the audio clips and sort of pictures from the set and reconstruct the episodes as best you can. Yeah, because we should just say, when you say completely lost, for those who don't know, 
the audio of all these episodes still exists. Yeah. It's just the BBC junked the tapes, but there were audio archives from fans mostly. Yeah, so so we have so you can experience those other stories in it is in a reduced format, but from someone who has like engaged with all of those uh, sort of reconstructed episodes, those are by far the most memorable and most interesting. And I think the massacre would be the best first Doctor story if it still existed. Um, and the but the Aztecs, the one we're talking about today, is I think you could very easily make the argument that this is the best first Doctor story also. So yeah, so one thing to talk about with this, um, and one of the main reasons why I picked this story is not just that it's really good. But that it is a, like what I like to call them, the, the true historical episodes, which is something that doesn't exist anymore in Doctor Who and really only existed mostly in the first Doctor era. You had the Highlanders in the second Doctor era, which is basically a, straight, a true historical. And then there's one in the fifth Doctor era called like Black Orchid or something like that. That's OK. That, that also is a straight his, or a true historical. And what I be, mean by that term is that these are stories that take place in a historical setting and are about that historical setting and do not feature any sort of fantastical or like explicitly fantastical elements. So there are no aliens, there's no monsters, there's no spaceships, there's, there's none of the sort of science fiction side of the show is, is there other than the fact that you have your main cast have time traveled there. And obviously the Doctor himself is an alien, although we don't even really know that much about him at this point in time because he's still... You know, this is the sixth serial in the first season. He's an incredibly mysterious figure at this point for the audience. And so one thing I really like about sort of looking at this episode and, and this era of the show was that sense of you would have these true historical stories that just were about the time period they were set in and dealing with the fact that, you know, the doctor and his companions uh, are outsiders to this society or culture or place or event and have to sort of find some way to navigate it without dying and and without like ruining all of history and get out and like like you know kind of like live with that adventure and it's just a, a kind of story that quickly went away and got completely replaced by there being those like straight science fiction stories which we get all the time in doctor who and then you have these pseudo historical episodes which is what we get every now and then which is like season 10 the season's thin ice episode where it's like it is set in a historical time period but the plot does revolve around a giant alien monster that's sleeping under the frozen Thames, you know and the aztecs doesn't have anything like that and that's one of the reasons why i love these kinds of episodes is that having this straight historical and true historical setting without a fantastical element allows you to tell i think what is a more sort of like purely drama story and less of like this sort of like science fiction adventure story that doctor who is we're so used to doctor who telling that when you go back to these, that they're incredibly fresh. Absolutely. So I should say, you know, I had not seen the Aztecs before. Yeah. I've seen some other First Doctor serials, and I, I love the First Doctor. William Hartnell is one of my favorite Doctors, absolutely. And I was still blown away by the uh -huh. Aztecs because, you know, you can take all the cliches about classic Doctor Who, that it can be very slow, that episodes can maybe take too long to kind of get around. You know, there's maybe too many episodes in a serial. Right. That sometimes the production values can be um, distracting or something like that. And while this does have low production values because, you know, classic Doctor Who and they shot it kind of fast. Holy crap, this was phenomenal. This uh -huh. is such a good 100 minutes roughly of television. It, it, it does not waste time. Every scene I thought was just cracking. The acting is so good. The writing is very thoughtful. It gets into some interesting, you know, kind of colonialist, colonial kind of territory yeah. thematically, I think, particularly in the third episode. But it's still so interestingly crafted. It's such a creative story. I think it does such great character work, particularly with the Doctor and Barbara. Um, the whole thing is just, it's a really fantastic 100 minutes of television, whether it was made in 1964 or not, whether, you know, William Hartnell occasionally flubs a line and just has to go with it, because they right. didn't have the money for second takes. Yeah. Um, and I should say, even though, you know, low production values, classic Doctor Who, this still, the production design on this one, I think is very impressive, especially when you hold it up to, you know, maybe some other examples from around the time. Just the costuming, and I love the matte paintings in this. Yeah. It is It is a very, very good story. Uh, on top of just, you know, it's just good as storytelling, whether or not it's Doctor Who. But it's another reminder that Doctor Who, from year one, could be whatever the fuck it wanted to be. Exactly. And that's the wonderful thing about it. Yeah. Yeah. Going to, like, the production value thing, that's one of the other reasons why I think the historical episodes from the first Doctor era are, like, hold up really well, generally, compared to some of the science fiction stories, is that the BBC production department at, department at the time was much, much better at realizing historical setting than they were 
you know, a spaceship setting. And it's like, and that makes a lot of sense that they, you know, there were lots of costume dramas that the BBC were putting on at the time. So they had lots of people highly experienced with that kind of work of building these kind of sets, making these sort of Aztec costumes and all that stuff. And it, there's, you know, it's hard in 1964 to have had enough experience to know how what, like, the interior of a Dalek spaceship is going to look like. And so it's right. like a lot of sort of painted cardboard things that are stuck onto walls that in, like, a long hallway with mirrors at either end to make you think that it's a lot longer hallway than it actually is. Yeah, so like, you know, I mentioned there are some little production hiccups like line flubs here and there. There's a moment in the first episode that I love where the camera is doing a pan in and clearly hits something. Yeah, it hits an object. And then has to keep going. And I find all of those things charming because the cast are all consummate professionals. They might flub, but then they just get right back on it. And frankly, like, William Hartnell always makes it seem like a character tick. (laughs) He's so good at it. But, you know, you look through all of that, that the the video looks kind of fuzzy today. It's not obviously the best quality and no one's gone in and done, like, a super extensive restoration on this. But I do think those costumes especially are super impressive. I think the one Barbara wears through a lot of this is is so great and such a part of the character she has in this. Yeah. Uh, and then I do really do love the matte paintings. Yes. And in black and white yeah. and everything. I think there's some really nice production work on this one. Uh, in addition to just being a, a darn good script, a darn good story, a great showcase for the cast at this point where Doctor Who was an ensemble. You really can't say... Any one person is the main character of first year Doctor Era Doctor yeah. Who. The way you know past that, you would always say oh, the Doctor is the main character of Doctor Who. I don't think you can really say that about the William Hartnell Doctor in the same no. way. And I think this this serial is a great example of that, where all four members of the main cast get time to shine. Susan is kind of on the sidelines for a lot of this. I read that Carol Ann Ford was on vacation for yes. two. Yes, she was on vacation for episodes two and three, so they shot basically like insert scenes for her in at the end of Keys of Marinus, which was the previous serial, to sort of like have her technically be present in those episodes. But yeah, yeah she doesn't have much to do in the middle part. But. but she still has nice moments. Ian has great moments. And I do think uh, Barbara particularly steals the fucking show. Yeah. And I, I love this first TARDIS cast. Yeah, so I think that's where we can sort of like um, dig into the structure of the episode because I think one of the things that makes it work particularly well and one of the reasons why it holds up and is still really enjoyable is that it has a really great sense of pacing which is generally the number one issue with classic Doctor Who is that there's normally no sense of pacing. Like the, the classic classic Doctor Who thing is that episodes one and four are really good of a serial, of a four-part serial. Episode two is kind of okay. And episode three is just the most meandering, nothing like, nothing happens, nothing is accomplished. It's just like, really you should have been like, obviously there's like all this production stuff for why they would have been a four-part serial. It's like, in your heart of hearts, you know that everyone involved wanted to just be able to cut one of those episodes and compress it into like a three or two-part serial because it's like this, the introduction to the story is really great and the conclusion to the story is really great, but the in-between parts is, are typically really rough. But what the Aztecs manages to do is take such great advantage of having this four-person cast, in particular the sort of three-person, like sort of three-person sort of like subplot structure of the Doctor, uh, Barbara, and Ian, and then Susan has her stuff. But like we said, her role is somewhat diminished. But by splitting the plot pretty cleanly between those three characters. It manages to have this really fantastic sense of momentum as you shift to, like, what Ian is doing with Ixla and training, and then, like, the Doctor's trying to, you know, uh, seduce Kameka and sort of figure out how to get into the thing, and then into the tomb, and then Barbara is sort of having to play, like, these sides and try to pretend to be this goddess while and not giving herself away and so they all are developing their own subplots but then over the course of the story those subplots will intersect with one another and the doctor will enter Ian's story or or Barbara will enter the doctor's story and stuff like that will happen to to make it feel like this big kind of a live story cuz every character in this serial is very highly motivated like you know what each of their goals are. Like, Barbara has this kind of high-minded thing where she wants to try to rewrite history a little bit and yeah. use her knowledge as a teacher here in um, Aztec land. I don't know if you could really call it a, a super historic recreation when everyone is clearly British sure, in Mexico. Yes. But yes, yeah, so, so in my mind, it's just Aztec land. But no, it is... Uh, so she's trying to do that. The Doctor is trying to figure out how to get back into the TARDIS, basically. And Ian is embroiled in this sort of combat issue with this character. What's his name? Ixla. Ixla. And so all of that is very interesting, but then there is this overall through line for the whole team of, you know, in the first scene, the TARDIS is lost, as it often is. Yes. Because otherwise these serials would be much shorter. Yeah, it's and, like, oh, we landed at the Aztec times. Oh, this looks really fucked up. We shouldn't be here. Let's yes. leave. Right. So their overall goal is to get back into the tomb 
and take the TARDIS and get out of Dodge. Yeah. But there are a lot of steps along the way. And, and as the, the structure of the serial starts to reveal itself, especially, I think, in episodes two and three, where you realize, like, there's going to be an opportunity to get back to the TARDIS, and the stars kind of have to align for them, literally and figuratively. All of that makes it very exciting and propulsive. You know, I watched this in two sittings. I did episodes one and two, and then three and four. And mostly that was because after one and two, I was, I was like, tired and I had to go do something else. But I could have easily sat there and watched all four. It is a very propulsive serial. Yeah, I watched it. I think, because I've watched it three times now, and I think every time I've watched it, I just watched them all all the way through, which usually I kind of try to do what you did of like, I usually try to split classic Doctor Who in the middle because most of the stories have that like part two, part three problem and you get fatigued by the time you get to part three. Um, but this one, yeah, you just like, like you could just edit this all into one movie and it would play perfectly. I think. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about, um, cause I just want to get into this. I think that my favorite character, that's not one of the main cast. This story has one of the best villains in classic Doctor Who um, in the, the visage of Latoxel, played by John Ringham, who is the great, they're the high priest of sacrifice, who um, at the end of part one, what is probably the best cliffhanger in the entire history of Doctor Who, at the end of part one, he realizes that Barbara is not uh, the reincarnation of Yataxa and is instead a false goddess and that he's going to destroy her and he's straight up like he, he, because he's basically Yago. like this whole story has a like yes. Shakespearean thing that we can talk about uh, also but he has this very Shakespearean villain role like a Yago or something where he's kind of manipulating deceiving people but at the end of part one he looks straight into the camera and lets you the viewer know that he is onto this, and his role is to, to to make all of this fall apart. He has a full on aside to the audience, and I fucking love that. I think it's so smart, and it's, it's such a good choice. I mean, it's so Shakespearean. Like yes. it lets you know, like this is a Shakespearean character, and actually, that's when the character clicks into place for me. Uh-huh. Because for the first twenty five minutes, I mean, he's a broader character than anyone in this serial. But I think once you realize, okay, that's the wavelength he's playing on, is Shakespearean villain who will just full on, like Richard III, Iago, talk yeah. to the audience, then you're like, okay, I get this. I also love that the camera just holds on him, the actor has to hold that shit-eating grin long enough for them to put the next time on yeah. Doctor Who's screen up, which they normally, they don't do in the rest of the serial. They don't hold it on an image, they go to yeah. black, but they hold it on that, and then they have to come back to that image at the start of part two, so the yeah. actor does great work on that. Yeah. But yes, I mean, it's a really interesting, because he's a great villain, he's got a lot of personality, and we'll talk about that. The other thing for me, though, is that he kept the serial, and kind of the dynamic between him, Barbara, and the other, the Priest of Knowledge, what's his name? Uh, Otlock. Otlock. That dynamic was very interesting to me because no one is really fully in the right and no one is fully in the wrong in this story. Like, I'm sorry, the names are hard and you have Wikipedia in yes. front of you. What's the name? For, for who? The villain. Uh, Latoxel. Latoxel has a good point. Barbara's yeah. a false goddess and she's leading them astray, you know? So he just wants to get the false goddess out of his fucking temple, right? Yeah. But uh, the other Toxel, what's... Oxel? Otlock? Otlock, there we go, sorry. Otlock... Um, you know, kind of wants to believe Barbara because she seems nice and she seems he's a very pious man and all this. Meanwhile, Barbara thinks that she can help Aztec culture by trying to get rid of what she sees as the more barbarous aspects of their culture. And so it's this interesting three person dynamic where Barbara winds up hurting Otlock, who she doesn't want to, because Otlock's a good guy. And the, the villain is doing some bad things, but you also understand where he's coming from. Ultimately, he kind of wins. Yeah, no. Which yeah. is crazy. But, you know, it's, it's a really interesting story because I never quite knew where this was going to go with that specific triangle of characters. And I love that aspect of it. It really keeps you on your toes narratively. Yeah, and, and then the other sort of function that Latoxel serves is that he is one of the primary connecting bridges between all the three subplots because, you know, in his sort of like villainous fashion, he's... Like, trying to sort of grasp at every single straw available to him to dethrone Barbara and prove that she is, she is false, that she's not the reincarnation of your taxa. So he is getting involved with all the stuff. Because, I mean, he basically sets up everything between Ian and Ixla, and then he's sort of getting involved and then finds out um, once the, do- that the doctor's trying to get into the tomb and he's using that to his advantage. And so he is kind of moving between all three of the subplots and kind of helping, like... He's he's helping the audience sort of bridge those gaps while also trying to sort of like separate them and keep them apart, and then also is 
um, responsible for when Susan comes back into the story of sort of threatening her with, with being punished or becoming a sacrifice herself. And so he's manipulating all the sort of figures in the story and moving between all the different subplots to connect them, which is another like Shakespearean sort of thing. Like, weirdly, if this serial has a main character, it might be Latoxel, you know? Yeah. Because of his agency and how much he is present in everything. And, and as you say, he, he is victorious in yes. the end. Like, he is the one that... Because, of course, obviously, like we know in history, like, the Aztecs did not stop at any point committing human sacrifices. The, how they stopped, like, using human sacrifices is the Spaniards killed all of them. So that there was a sort of a very different scenario than, like, hey, maybe don't murder people. And it's like, ah, well... We, they didn't ever have to really cross that boat because we destroyed them. The Europeans destroyed them long before they had to sort of deal with that. So we know that obviously Latoxel has to be victorious in some way. We know that Barbara can't change history because we know what history is. And I think that sort of dynamic of that, that you, you, you want to kind of root for the, the Doctor Who crew, obviously, because they're the protagonist characters and you, you want to follow them and you're rooting for them. But at the same time, you know that what they're trying to do is impossible because we, because at, at this point, like Doctor Who had never even really like sort of played with the idea of like, oh, of course you would be able to change history. It was always, I think, kind of like assumed in the, the previous couple of historical episodes, uh, which is the, like the 10,000 BC, one of the cavemen and then Marco Polo. That's like, there's no question that these people are going to be able to change history because history is history. And so that dynamic, I think, is interesting. Well, and I love, like, Barbara's specific, and we'll talk a lot about Barbara, I'm sure, yeah. but, like, her specific, you know, uh, quest in this episode and her inner dilemma is so much more nuanced than I think it is for a lot of modern Who stories that do the historical thing where it's like, you know, how are we going to change history and, and something like that. And that's led to good stories, like the one where Rose goes back and saves her dad in the sure, first yeah. season with Chris Father's Eggleston. Day. Father's yeah. Day. It was a very good episode. But, like, that is the kind of, like, rewriting history thing that is so heightened but also personally immediate. This is not that. Barbara has no like personal connection to the Aztecs. She's not trying to save a family member. It is this like what she thinks is a very charitable thing of like look at this great civilization and I feel like if I could just get rid of the bad things then they'll just be good, right? And that's an interesting thing to craft a story around. Yeah. And that but also like she does not get off scot free on that. She has to realize what is wrong with that line of thinking, which is that those two, you know, the good and the bad in a society are not separate. They're right. very much... They coexist and they have to exist together. And that's why the Latoxel character is so important. That's why her, you know, relationship with Otlock is so important. And realizing, you know, that ultimately what she's doing might be more harmful than it is good. It makes for... Like, like the final scenes of this, ep of this serial, you know, where she is in the TARDIS with her... Right outside the TARDIS with the Doctor, kind of... And they have a little, you know, moment talking about the events of the episode. is surprisingly powerful. Yeah. Because of how much... I think thematic weight goes into that last conversation. Not to get ahead of ourselves, right. but it's just, it's all, that's why, you know, this is, this is a really complicated, like, piece of drama that this that was crafted here. Yeah, and that's, it's one of the reasons why I think the true historical story has so much power and potential in it is because, because, like, you have to contend with this fact that you can't change history, because if you could change history, it would be a totally different show. And the way that, like, that's the pseudo-historical story, how that kind of deals with it is that, like, the Doctor and the cast get to change history by not changing history, right? Because they are, instead of being this radical force, which is what Barbara is trying to be, Barbara wants to be this radical force in history that changes the customs of the Aztecs. In a pseudo-historical, the Doctor and the companion get to act as this sort of, like, stabilizing force in history, and some other alien, some other monster, some other, like, science fiction construct or fantastical construct gets to act as the radical force that the Doctor stamps down. And that allows for, like, a much more sort of typical story that I feel like are fine. Like, I have, there are plenty of pseudo-historicals I've enjoyed, but having that, like, sort of almost sort of like tragic structure in a lot of ways to the, the true historical episodes, which almost all of the true historical episodes are very dark. Like this, like this one is pretty dark. Marco Polo like is a long one. So it kind of goes up and down, but H like history is dark. Yeah. History is dark because like some of the other historical episodes are like the reign of terror set in the French revolution. And obviously nobody was able to go like the doctor did not go in and say like, Hey, a lot of your like ideals are great, but maybe you should stop fucking murdering everybody. That doesn't work in the reign of terror. You know, the, the massacre of science, St. Bartholomew's Eve, um, one of the uh, the writer's other episodes, uh, John Lucarotti, 
that one, like, obviously, they're not able to stop the massacre at St. Bartholomew's Eve, and that almost sort of destroys the Doctor's relationship with his companion Steve in that episode. And so it's a, a really interesting structure for these stories that, again, like, there's with the, the sort of higher production values and, and kind of what feels like more generally nuanced storytelling in modern Doctor Who, it feels like such a missed opportunity that you don't grasp at some of these themes and some of these ideas because... I think the Aztecs has this really interesting sort of dilemma of how to deal with things like cultural relativism of how, like, does Barbara have any right or place to come into this culture? She is displaced both in terms of like time and space, because it's not like it's ancient Britain. It's, you know, ancient Mexico. She has no connection to the Aztecs at all, other than that she studied them when she was at university. And that's one of her specialties, she says at the beginning of the episode. So it's like she has no personal relationship to this at all. What right does she have to go in? Even if I think everyone would agree that like sacrificing humans is a pretty fucked up thing to do. I would prefer that people do not ritually sacrifice other people. I think that's generally, I think is a normally accepted thing in modern society. What place do you have going into the ancient Aztec society and telling them like, no, all of your cultural values built around this construct is wrong because it's wrong to my, the cultural values I have in modern day. Even if, like I do, like I think again. Everyone for this like specific example, it's very easy to just say like, of course it's awful, of course it's wrong. But there are all these other sort of like cultural constructs and, and cultural things and, and artifacts of Aztec history and Aztec society that were built around this concept of, of human sacrifice. And I think the the research that John Lucarotti uh, sort of committed in, in in writing this story and most of his other histories really shines through because it is like I mean you can like make fun of the fact that obviously like they're all British actors in like, you know, with like black hair wigs and stuff like that. They're, they didn't get a bunch of Mexican actors in 1964 in the BBC. There are things you can make fun of and, and sort of like when and how they portrayed it for the, because of how dated it is. But at the same time, I'm always, when I rewatch this impressed by how much effort and commitment and, and, and thoughtfulness really went into trying to sort of portray this. Um, as respectfully as possible, considering, again, it's fucking 1964. Most of the time, if you're going back to 1964, like, you go back and watch a fucking, like, Western from the 60s, they're probably not going to deal with, like, issues with Native Americans in a way yeah. as well as this one dealt with the, uh, the Aztec society. Yeah, and, and I think we can put the actor issue aside pretty easily. This is, you know, we probably wouldn't do it like this today. Yeah. But, you know, look, the, you mentioned Shakespeare. This is part of a tradition of doing historical storytelling, is it just, you have... The actors of the area stand in for wherever in the world you are. Right. It's not. It's not a like a uniquely you know racist thing to do in terms of film, even if it might be seen as problematic now. Uh, you know, I don't think the Aztecs completely escapes a sort of colonial gaze. Sure. There's the in but, episode in part three. Ian uses the word civilized in like a way yes. that's very specifically like ooh yeah oh you really wouldn't use that word that way today, dude. At least nobody calls anybody a savage though. I no. really appreciated that. <laughs> yes. But I know, and I so we we can talk about some of those the colonial gaze issues because I think they're interesting. But yes, I think it's very well researched. Like I have not seen another Aztec story that deals as much with like the religious aspects of it yeah. and and seeing the the human sacrifices be like no, this is an honor thing for me. And I think just bringing something like that in to immediately complicate the idea. Like I love like the climax of part one is Barbara decides I'm going to stop this human sacrifice, and the guy's like, well, I want to die, so he just jumps off the yeah. wall. That's a really interesting idea. So, I, yeah, I agree. I think it's very well researched, and I think it does come at Aztec society with a view of empathy, not a completely colonial gaze. Yeah. Now, you can't escape it entirely. These are British people in 1964. Yeah. British people in 2017 aren't going to escape it entirely either. But, like, because, you know, I think there's some of... I was reminded a little bit of the bad Mel Gibson movie, Apocalypto, just oh, yeah. in the view of, like... The oh yeah, the the Aztecs were destroying themselves from within. So what does it matter if the colonists came in at the end? Which is basically the message of Apocalypto. That movie is so fucking racist. And this is nowhere near that. But I still, whenever you approach it, because you're right, we would all pretty much agree human sacrifice equals bad. Yeah. But I also think that it's like reducing Aztec society to that and saying like. That's how they were destroying themselves from within, blah, blah, blah. You know, I think it is a simple-minded view on those things yeah. and kind of a colonial view. But there is so much more to this story than that. And that the, the dominant kind of colonial view coming in doesn't win in the story is really important. Yeah. Like, Barbara doesn't 
and Barbara's not a bad person or anything. She's, she's a very good person. She's yeah. doing this completely out of, you know, pure hearted motives, even if she's maybe a little misguided in them. Um, Barbara doesn't win. Barbara has to learn her lesson. And the Aztec society kind of gets to go on. Yeah. You know, almost in a Star Trek, you know, um, first principles kind of thing. Sure, yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. I, yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what you said on that. Yeah, because it is like, and again, like going back to, because while we're talking about it, might as well talk about it, of like that one instance of, in part three, Ian is talking about Otlock and, and calls him civilized as opposed to Latoxel, who is then by implication uncivilized. Again, Nogi uses the word savage, which is like, for me, that's like the big one. Yeah. That's the big fucking one that like really sets me off. But like that, that concept of like, oh, he's civilized and he's not civilized. And it's like, the motherfucker, they're, you're, they're literally part of the same civilization. Like, what, right. like, think about that word and think about what that word means and where that word comes from. Like, that's a fucking crazy thing to, and like a racist thing to say. But like, other than that one, but I still think like the speech and like the, like what Ian is trying to get across of that Otlock is someone who thinks for himself and is an individual and is sort of like 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 is interested in pursuing sort of like knowledge in these things for his own sort of individual enlightenment, whereas Latoxel is more interested in sort of like controlling and manipulating society and being at the top of society. Like that um, dichotomy is still there and I think is still valuable and is not necessarily racist on its own, but the, like the, like Ian has no sort of vocabulary to sort of approach it without invoking this idea that Otlock is more European in some way and the Latoxel is more Aztec in some way. Sure. And so that's like, for me, that was the most sort of problematic or whatever. Sort it of feels in sentiment. character. It feels in character for Ian. That's true. Yeah, I, like I, I don't he, like Ian is not necessarily going to be like this super woke liberal or something. No. Yeah, but it, it is like the one area where you feel like I think the datedness of it shows through more than anywhere else. But the most impressive thing about it is that that's the only time that happens because. I, I have seen every fucking Doctor Who story. Let me tell you, there are other Doctor Who stories where they are not this thoughtful about these kinds no, of things. No, no, yeah, absolutely. Like, we, I, you have seen the talents of Wang Shiang. Yes. It's a great episode, but... But, right? yes, yeah, exactly, yes. Yeah. Um, no, and I want to say one other thing about the historical framework and, like, the human sacrifice thing. It also creates a really interesting dynamic early on where the Doctor just has to say to Barbara and his companions, you've got to let the human sacrifice go on. We can't change history. I know it's going to be horrific, but he says, Ian, you got to bring the guy there, and Barbara, you got to let them do it. The doctor does not have to make those kind of decisions in historical stories anymore. Yeah, you know, exactly, like, yeah. And it's, it's almost like that was this moment for me of like, I had to think about, like, how does that track with what I know about the doctor? And it's hard because the show does not create those scenarios in history mostly for the doctor to confront, you know? Yeah. Like, you come up to the the outskirts of it sometimes like in the van gogh episode with matt smith in that you know he knows van gogh is going to kill himself but matt smith still takes him to see the art museum and all that great i love that episode to yeah, death yeah but like that is not the same kind of dilemma you know peter capaldi this season we had the episode with the the scotsman and the the, the whole issue with the romans and yeah, stuff the eaters of light yeah, yeah the eaters of light which again approaches the outskirts of some of those ideas but it's a sci-fi story so it's heightened and different this is the doctor just straight up saying yeah we're gonna watch a guy get his heart cut out and i think that's an interesting thing and it does ultimately track with i think what we would think about the doctor but again the doc the doctor in future lives doesn't have to make those decisions a lot and so yeah. it's a very interesting different shading for this character yeah, so I guess like now let's talk about the doctor's side of the story um, because he, I think it's like an important bit of context for this point in the show is that like we don't know anything about the doctor like at all. They have not like Time Lords is not a thing. Gallifrey is even further from being a thing. Like they don't mention Gallifrey until the first, I think the fourth doctor's era is when they first say that. Um, or no, I think the third, somewhere in the third Doctor they do it. But like the, the word Time Lord is not mentioned until the last second Doctor story. So we're so far away from sort of broaching those ideas. All we know about the Doctor and Susan is that they are not humans, that they are traveling through time. The Doctor has is probably some sort of fugitive, is sort of hinted at in an unearthly child. But like just very vaguely you get the sense that like they can't go home for some reason. And so they're just traveling through time, observing things. They have the silly time machine that got stuck as a 1960s police box. Which again, like for this era, that would have been contemporary. Like a police box would have been something that existed in London and in England. Like in the larger area of the UK. 
And so, but you don't have this idea necessarily automatically of the Doctor being this, like, sort of righteous superhero character that, like, particularly in New Doctor Who, um, I think around the Tenet era is where they started sort of, like, getting into that territory of, like, you know, the classic Tenet speech of I'm 904 years old and blah, 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 and I'm going to save everybody's lives. Like, that, that kind of thing. The Doctor does not do that at all. Like, he's not known to the audience that well. He's certainly not known to Ian and Barbara almost at all. And Ian and Barbara are, like, mostly our POV characters since In Another Three Child. And Ian is arguably the male lead of the show. Like, he's the one who's given all the action. Like, he's the one who, who, like, is often sort of, like, the driving force in a lot of matters because he's, like, the young strapping dude or whatever. Which is one of the reasons why you have this expanded cast is because the Doctor was this sort of distant, cantankerous, older male figure and that was not necessarily the sort of like action lead character that he's turned into more since the the William Hartnell days. And so he gets to be like almost villainous at times. And I don't think he's ever like quite a straight villain other than when he almost murders a dude with a rock in 10,000 BC. That's where you're like, okay, this is, okay, stop for a second. You're going a bit too far here, Doc. Um, but other than that time, which again, that's the first story. So you allow him one attempted murder and it's like we'll, we'll get on our we'll we'll sort of talk this through, but yeah, but but by the, but even by the time with the Aztecs, when you've spent more time with him and gotten more comfortable with him, he's still able to be this kind of oppositional figure because I think the intention, certainly probably at the time, like I don't know how the episode plays necessarily today, especially if you have the larger context of Doctor Who, where you're like very much conditioned to side with the Doctor if you've seen modern Doctor Who. I think at the time, like it was more like felt that like, yeah, like he. Barbara's probably right here. Like, like the doctor is like kind of coming on strong and like, like, no, like we should be doing our best to sort of like fix this situation and like, like be like these good, like British people coming in and fixing all these barbaric customs. You know, that's, that's what our role should be. And the doctor's like, no, like you can't rewrite history. Not one line. Like, and that's a, such a different sort of feel to the character than what you get today. I agree because, you know, I watched this episode or any First Doctor episode, frankly, and you kind of watch it with two minds. Because of, in one mind, like the modern mindset, where you're comparing him to 9, 10, 11, 12 or something, yeah. right? He's, it's paradoxically a much younger man, you uh-huh. know? He is, William Hartnell looks like the oldest Doctor, but he's the youngest of all of them. Yeah. And he's still kind of becoming the person we're going to know later on. He's much rougher around the edges. And I think that's a fascinating, wonderful dynamic there that speaks to the show's longevity. That You can go back to when they were literally feeling out the character. Well, the Doctor was feeling out his own character in some yeah. ways, right? And that's a really exciting thing to kind of play with. But at the same time, yes, if you look at it with the mindset of like try to think of it like someone watching this for the first time in 1964, I totally agree with you on that. Like You can watch this in... Barbara is the person with the major arc here, you know, and Ian to a lesser extent. But it's mostly Barbara's story, and it's Barbara kind of learning to realize, oh, the Doctor was right. And it's not the same kind of thing you would get now where the Doctor will say something and we just assume he is right, and then the rest of the story we work with that assumption, right? Yeah. That's not what the Aztecs is at all, and it's about coming around to that way of thinking. And when the Doctor is on screen, even though he's he's mostly a very nice chap in this episode... He's romancing a woman for much yes. of it, although I don't know if he knows he's doing that. Um, you know, he's still mysterious, and he has. There's an edge to him that even if you go like super dark Peter Capaldi, it's not the same kind of edge yeah. anymore. It, it just can't be. Twelfth Doctor can't. You know, just think of the number of Doctors, right? Right. So yeah, and and I just also you know. Each one of these episodes we do is also going to have to be a little mini celebration of the Doctor. Yeah. And, God, William Hartnell is so good. He's so good. He is a... It's a phenomenal performance. Like, just... He has so much life and vitality to what he does. I love... It really does feel like a classically trained actor kind of situation where everything he's doing feels so considered. Like, when he grabs his lapels or he makes his little (laughs) kind of noise or just when he, he often, like, looks away kind of off to the side... Um, not quite, quite to the camera, like off camera, but not at the person, not eye line to the person he's talking to, because he's so sort of aloof yeah. and all of these things. And it's it's just it's a beautiful characterization. It's a compelling characterization. When he is on screen, the show just lights up even more than normal. And I think this you know episode shines very bright throughout. But man, when William Hartnell is on screen, it's it's a bundle of fun. Yeah, no, like, his performance is is always fantastic. Like, his characterization of the Doctor is so interesting because, like, because I think you also, this is one of the, the stories where you start seeing a slow transition that, like, does not culminate until, until after the first season. But, like, he starts from this, like, 
very rough around the edges place. Because also, like, you have to keep in mind, the, like, classic Doctor Who was not shot in the way that, like, modern TV shows are shot. Like, if you're assuming that's like, oh, they shoot, like, most of the first season and, like, some of it, like, they maybe shoot, like, episode three first because of, like, scheduling for locations and stuff. The way that it is works today. No, like, they shot these all in order. Like, like it's like, you know, they, they went by script to script to script to script and they, like, went out, like, all year round, basically. A like, better, that's one of the reasons why Susan or uh, the, uh, fuck, what's the... Carol Ann Ford. Yeah, Carol Ann Ford. Um, one of the reasons why she is mostly absent from episodes two and three is because she needed a vacation because the production schedule was just constant. The better comparison now would be a soap opera. It's yeah. the same kind of production. It's it's the quicker, you know, fewer cuts, fewer um, shot setups, fewer takes, and just shoot it, get it out. Next day we shoot the next episode. Yeah, so, like, the, the sort of season transition is not necessarily as, like meaningful it's certainly not as meaningful as it is today so you really have to take it more of like this like story by story thing of like over time William Hartnell is sort of molding his performance each time they're doing one of these stories of starting from this like really cantankerous place and then in Aztecs he's in like this more transitional area of you kind of get like this really rich sense of like all these sides of this character of you know his interactions with Kameka and stuff are like very sweet and kind but then when someone is doing something that like he disagrees with like like when Barbara's trying to change history He's like very angry. He's very forthright about it. He's very snappish. And you get like all those shades of the character because he's in this transitionary period. I also love how f- valuable the Doctor is yeah. in these stories. Like the great scene, it's in episode three. I th- it's the set, it's the cliffhanger in episode three where he's trying to get this rock out and he can't lift it. He's too yeah. old and weak. So Ian comes in, lifts the rock, and Ian goes into the tunnel to see what's in there. And then uh, the other, Ixl comes in. Ixla. Ixla. And just puts the stone back on. And the doctor's like, fuck, Ian's going to drown. Yeah, and, and, and like he can't fight Ixla or yeah. anything because Ixla's this giant Aztec warrior. You know, if the 12th doctor met Ixla, he would just stare him down. Uh-huh. That's not who the first doctor is. And I love those moments. It's, it's such a different shading while also... You look at this and you're like, it is amazing, 50-some years later, that this is still recognizably the same character uh-huh. that Peter Capaldi is currently playing. Yeah. You know? I love that. But yeah, but like one of the things that, that is awesome is that sense of... One of the things I just have always loved about classic Doctor Who is that like the Doctor... like it, It's sort of, in some ways, exemplified by the first Doctor, but it's true, I think, all throughout. Up until like it starts changing a little bit in the 6th and 7th is where you start getting the kind of superhero thing... But, like, the Doctor feels very vulnerable. He, like, does not feel, like, necessarily, like, if he ran into any situation, he'd just be able to get out of it immediately. Like, because he hasn't had a million adventures at this point. Like, he's still just sort of, like, kind of starting out and doing this thing of bopping around in history. And he knows more than anyone else in the TARDIS crew. But he still is liable to make a mistake. Like, he, you know, like, one of the major subplots of the episode is that he makes a poison for Ixla that Ixla uses against Ian. So it's like he makes mistakes in his way more fallible and way more vulnerable here than if you like what you might be used to from modern Doctor Who of where you know he, he will make mistakes and stuff in modern Doctor Who but that's like such a bigger deal is like it, you have to in modern Doctor Who when the Doctor makes a mistake that has to be like the point of the story it's like oh he fucked up in classic talk to me, he's like he's fucking up all the time because he barely understands what he's doing. Because like, how would he know? Like, he is this like much smaller part of a vast universe in classic Doctor Who, and just like the nature of having the show go on for that long with the same continuity in modern Doctor Who, the, oftentimes it feels like the Doctor is much bigger than the universe he occupies, which is not necessarily better or worse. But there's something I really love about that older sort of like like getting lost in the universe feeling that classic Doctor Who has. It's one of the wonderful things about the show's longevity is that that evolution is organic, you know, yeah. that once he's been adventuring on our screens for 50 years and in time and space for a millennium or something, naturally his role in the universe is going to change. Yeah. But going back to this origin point is a lot of fun. Yeah. So you want to talk a little bit about, um, I think we talked about the Doctor, we talked about Ian a little bit, he gets to have his gladiatorial adventures. Yes, he gets to have a lot of very, like, classic Star Trek, like, yes. Kirk style, like, double fist over someone's, and, like, he straight up Vulcan neck pinches Ixla. Yep. It's it's very good. It's very good. I like his final fight with Ixla. Yeah. At the, the climax of episode four, because it's ridiculous. Yeah, and you can really feel, like, the entire production of the episode, like, straining to try to have an action climax, and it's like... I think they pull it off, which is I like too. really impressive when you understand the constraints that they were on at the time to like be able to actually fucking film all of that. Yeah, but I do want to come back to Barbara and talk okay, about yeah. her a little bit here because 
So, you know, if you've watched An Unearthly Child, you know the origin here, which is Ian and Barbara are uh, teachers at Coal Hill School, yes. and they come to investigate. Susan is really smart, but she's also really weird what's going on with her. And then the doctor fucking kidnaps them. Yeah. But they become friends. It's all good. But he gets them, or, well, he doesn't get them back in their own time. They kind of manage to get back their own time eventually. So yeah. it's all good. He tries, kind yeah. of. Anyway, but, uh, yeah, so, so, but Barbara at this point, you know, had she had a story where she was this central to it yet? Um, like Marco Polo, they all have pretty big subplots. I'm trying to think. Um, Keys of Marinus is one. I think she has a pretty significant role in one of the episodes because Keys of Marinus, the one right before this, is interesting because each episode is basically its own story. Oh, which nice. Is kind of a different one, but this is definitely the most prominent she's been in the show up to this point. Yeah, and I just I love the way she carries herself. I love how she plays. Barbara playing a character, you know, yeah. like it's what's the name of the actress? Do you have it there? Um, yeah, uh, Jacqueline Hill. Jacqueline Hill, yeah, who is sadly died young at the age of like sixty-two or something yeah. in the '90s. But anyway, Jacqueline Hill, I think, is so good at playing Barbara, playing this goddess character, right? Yeah, and and how you're constantly aware of that dynamic, but she also like she seems just so confident and happy playing this role, and it's almost like she's having fun doing this even though it's a very stressful you know high stakes situation and the way she modulates that over the course of the four episodes and you know she'll jump from talking to um oxel i'm sorry uh, otlock yes otlock Otlock to then she'll snap to talking to the doctor or ian or something and she's playing all these different sides and the overall we've talked about the kind of dilemma she's under i think it's a great performance love the costume design on on her big headdress and everything in this one yeah and then the, the last scene with her and william hartnell at the end of the episode is just beautiful so yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, like all the the actors at the time, like like that, just that core cast is so strong. And this is probably, I would say, Jacqueline Hill's most sort of like standout role. Like she's always good, but this gives her, I think, probably like the most prominence. I'd have to like think like a lot longer to like like sort that out in my head if that's entirely true. But this is definitely one of her most sort of like striking performances because she is so central. And it is one of the cool things when you think about the history of the show that like, again, this is 1964. Like you didn't have necessarily a lot of female characters like in like such a position of prominence and power in stories all the time. And so like, you have to like keep in mind that the producer was Verity Lambert, who was like the first and youngest female producer at the BBC and, and stuff like that, that it does have this like, alongside I think the much more sort of mature and sophisticated look at Aztec culture the show was really ahead of its time in 1964. Yeah I mean because Barbara like she you know you would expect in a show of 1964 you have two characters Ian and Barbara traveling with the doctor that Barbara is Ian's girlfriend and that's all she's there for or something right right? and that's not it at all like I know in expanded lore like we've gotten to a place where they're married and stuff but that's not the story at this point in the show right? No yeah there's like a couple of like hints that maybe they have like some sort of romantic attraction but it is not over at all. No and so Barbara is her own character she can be her own character she doesn't always have to be the main character Character. Sometimes it's Ian, sometimes it's her, sometimes it's Susan, whatever. But I do love that that dynamic, and and this is this is one of my favorite classic Doctor Who stories I've seen, Sean. This yeah. is a fantastic one. It's it is really good. Like it's a yeah. I would definitely recommend thing. anyone wanting to get into classic Doctor Who watch the one Unear- Unearthly Child episode just yeah. to like get into what's the setup because it's a really fun little episode. Yeah. But then like this would be a great one to start with if you're watching along with us because I think this shows you some of the best of what the show has to offer. Yeah, I mean, that's actually kind of a funny story around that, that this was when I decided to watch Doctor Who for the first time, like, like the process I went through was like, oh, like, I've been hearing so much about this Doctor Who show, it sounds interesting, and then it's like, I looked it up on the internet, like, looked it up on the Wikipedia stuff, it's like, oh, this is, this is an amazing idea, like, this science fiction show that's been running for not quite 50 years at that point when I started watching, which was like six years ago or something now, it's like way longer than it should be now since I watched Doctor Who but like, and, and looked at all this stuff. It's like, oh, this different actor playing this character over time. It's like that's really cool. And then they, they it went away in the '80s, and they brought it back in 2005. And I guess this that's like the version that everyone is super excited about. That I've been hearing about at school. And it's like, okay, I'll try watching this. But me being as obsessive as possible, I was like, well, I want to at least get like a sense of what like the old stuff was before I started with the new stuff. But I didn't immediately plan on I'm just going to watch everything because that's fucking crazy, even for me. But when I, I what they, I did sort of plan on doing was, oh, at the time Netflix had classic Doctor Who on there, and they had two or three stories per Doctor in, in general. Is like obviously a like brief smattering of what classic Doctor Who was. 
but it was there. It was like the most easily accessible version of it. So I was like, oh, I'll start with that and just start with the earliest one they have on Netflix. Watch all the classic Doctor Who they have on Netflix, which is like a dozen stories or something like that, and then start with modern Doctor Who. That seems reasonable. And I started watching Aztecs, and it was like I was interested because the Aztecs was the earliest one they had on there. I was like, oh, this is really interesting. But I just had that nagging like thing, like the voice in the back of my head. But it's like, but you don't quite know who these characters are, do you? It's like, no, I don't. Yeah, like who is Ian and Barbara? Like I get this. I know that that's the Doctor. And it's like, and who? But who's this this young girl with him? Like who's that? Like what is all this? Like well. Maybe I'll just try. I'll I'll go watch the first one, and then so that I, you couldn't easily watch it under the child at the time. So then I went on the internet and watched that one. I was like, "Well, fuck, yeah, ah, shit." It's and, a good origin yes. story. You know, Sean, I'm doing the math in my head. I started watching Doctor Who in 2008. Yeah. I, I know that because it was around the time of David Tennant's last season. I think it was 2008 because uh, his last season was in 2009, and that means I've almost been watching this show for 10 years. Yeah, <laughs> which. I don't even want to think about it. That's yes. a long time. That's yeah. almost half my life. Yeah. There, there's definitely, for me, there's like the before I watched Doctor Who and after I watched Doctor Who period of my life. Yeah. Like, it, it's like the, it's the BDW and ADW. It's like uh, it's how know, I date it. When John Sim came back for the two episodes this year with the, the Peter Capaldi episodes, I went back and watched his first episodes of the Ma- as the Master, and I realized yeah. I haven't watched these in this decade. Uh-huh. And it was, I have never felt so old. Yeah. But anyway, speaking of old things, the Aztecs, yes. you should watch it. Thank you, Sean, for recommending this. That was a hell it's, of a time. It's really fantastic. And but, but right before we finish this up, I just want to note one last thing. We have not talked about Kameka, the Doctor's... Yeah. Brilliant love interest. His only, in my heart, in my heart of hearts, the only love interest for the Doctor, <laughs> Kameka. Yes, Kameka is great. You She's get the, the whole thing with the cocoa beans, the and cocoa then there beans. is the the payoff to that joke where the Doctor comes to Barbara and is like, a, "I said my fiance." He's like, "You have a fiance." He's like, "Oh, I apparently drank some cocoa beans, and now yeah. I'm engaged." Hil- fucking hilarious. Hilarious, but the real punchline, it's like, it's not a, it's not a, a ha-ha punchline, it's a punch-of-the-gut punchline, is the yes. very end, the last scene in the episode, which is, this is one of those, like, sort of, for me, defining moments of Doctor Who that I will always remember this mm-hmm. scene, because it's, it's such a, like, character-building moment for him, is he, he leaves the, the bracelet or whatever that, that Kamiki gave him on the altar, and it goes into the TARDIS, and then it, like, hangs on that shot for a little bit. And then he comes back out and is like, and then grabs it and puts it in his pocket, goes back in and shuts the door, and the TARDIS dematerializes. And I think it's such a sweet, smart moment that, like, to me, is when you talk about how amazing it is that, like, this character is still this character, I feel like you can so see the Doctor in that moment. You can see th- any Doctor would have done exactly that. Like, yes. you can see. Peter Capaldi, like, would doing that, like, leaving that there is like, I'm not, like, I'm better than this. I'm not going to get attached to this weird little personal thing. She's just, like, one human for, for one of my adventures and then, like, stopping for a second being like, oh, I've just got to take it and, and go inside and not tell anyone about it and just keep it for himself. Yep. No. It's be- beautiful. Love it. So, Sean, you want to tell us what we're watching next month? So, next month, we are moving on from the first Doctor and, and, and leaving him to go to the second Doctor, Patrick Troughton, who is still probably my personal favorite Doctor. I don't know how... It's, it's kind of like an intractable situation that at some point he can't be un, un, dethroned for me. But we're going to watch um, Tomb of the Cybermen, which is possibly the best, or my personal favorite at the very least, Doctor Who story. And, and it's the very best uh, Cybermen story, and I'm very excited to talk about it with you. It is. I have not seen it yet, which is funny, because yeah. it's one of the most famous Doctor Who stories. Uh, famously, Matt Smith talked about it a lot, being a huge influence on his performance, um, just in terms of recent Doctor Who history. Yeah. So I'm excited to watch that one with you. And if you're listening to this in the podcast feed, that means you're not a Patreon. If you get on our Patreon, $5 level, that's it, every month, yeah. you will get this episode a week early so you can listen to us talk about Doctor Who in the middle of each month instead of slightly later in each month. So I think that's a good reward. We also have our Let's Play stuff on there and other rewards. But this is one of them. So we hope you liked this first episode. Yeah. And we'll see you next month for Tomb of the, Ti- Tomb of the Cybermen. Yes, Tomb of the Cybermen where we will finally find out just who this Doctor guy is. <laughs>